Thanks yeah, so take us. us back a couple months ago. You're watching the Wizards, and you're just incredibly frustrated, right? Yes. Uh, probably the worst team I had ever seen in a long time of watching basketball. I was just like, this team has no chance. Uh, go ahead and mail it in. I'm looking at Keith Cunningham, Jonathan Kaminga. I'm already doing, you know, mock draft podcast. <laughs> off-season analysis of what trades they can make and who they need to pick up and why Scott Brooks needs to be gone, which I still believe he should be gone, but we can talk about that later. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it was very frustrating. They were also dealing with a lot of injuries, the COVID protocol, players just not performing up to snuff. And here we are now with the Wizards are, what, one game back of possibly taking over the eighth seed from Charlotte with, what, four games left in the season. So it's crazy. It's a really crazy turnaround. Yeah, it's been a crazy turnaround. For the first time in my career, I've always been anti-tank. Ever. I mean, I just, I think it's the worst. I think it's for losers. But they were so bad, they were so disinteresting that I said, finally, you know what, Tank? Go ahead, lose on purpose. And then, sure enough, they they go on this run. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't followed it super closely, but a lot of it seems to coincide with the acquisition of Gafford, right? He's come in and been like a rim protector, a finisher around the rim. He brings energy to the squad. I know it's hard to attribute a lot of that to a guy that's playing 15 minutes a game, but I just feel like there's something there, and it coincides with that acquisition. No, absolutely. You used the nail right on the head there. It's, it's not um, out of character to say or attribute a lot of their success to a defensive-minded big man. Like, they've tried everything. They've had a, a post-hook specialist, I guess you can call it, in uh, Robin Lopez. Right. And, you know, they're just about average with him. They're not really good on defense at all. Alex Lynn is pretty much a hybrid between Rolo and Daniel Gafford. He has some size. He has a little bit of offensive skill, but he's still limited in terms of how he can move on defense. But Daniel Gafford is exactly what this team has been needing this entire time. This is somebody that is the exact makeup of what Wizards fans and what you know, the roster as well thinks that they've always needed a rim running defensive minded big after his first game with the wizards, which was incredible. By the way, he came into the post game press conference and said, I think about defense first. I could care less about offense. I couldn't care less about offense. I want to be a defender. And that's exactly what this team needs. He's been playing phenomenally and they're probably a better defense. If he plays more minutes, like this whole center by committee thing that Scott Brooks is doing running three centers and the way that he shifts these guys, he go, he gives, uh, what, five or six minutes to Alex Lynn, then then Daniel Gafford for six minutes, and then runs Rolo for like 15 straight minutes. I mean, if they played Daniel Gafford out the gate and started him and have him out there with the best guys from from maybe, what, 20 minutes, 25 minutes a game, they're probably an even better defensive team. So he's been phenomenal. Uh, he hustles. The, the guys love him. And Russell Westbrook makes any center look good, especially pairing him uh, with the passing ability that Russell Westbrook has. So, I mean, it, it really could be scary for some playoff teams if – if Daniel Gafford gets more minutes, but he also has to work on his fouling too. You can't get three fouls in two minutes like he did the other night against Indiana. You got to be smart about that. He's learning still. He's a young guy, but he's really, really impressive. Quentin, it's it's nonsensical that Russell Westbrook is the fifth leading rebounder in the entire NBA. Here are the four guys in front of him: Clint Capella, six ten; Gobert, seven one; Valachunas, six yeah. eleven; Sabonis, six eleven; and then that little pipsqueak. Russell Westbrook <laughs> at 6-3, he's going in amongst the trees. And, you know, you, you pointed it out, that, that rebound that he got against the Pacers where it was three-on-one, where it was all heart and all determination. I mean, it's amazing what he's doing on the boards. Hey, but Rui gives you, like, five a game, Kate. Right. <laughs> hey, that's yeah. Drab's guy. <laughs> no, it's, it's crazy impressive. It's even more impressive when you think about the fact that he's 32 years old and he also had – a torn quadricep he played through earlier this season. So this is this is exactly what this team needs, just that the injection of life and the leadership that he does bring. Um, and he really just goes hard every single night. The most impressive thing that uh, does it for me is last game, he played 42 minutes. Like a lot of people talk about the fact like, oh, he made the game-saving block and he's getting rebounds. He played 42 minutes, and that was the second overtime game in, in, two, in the last two nights. So for him to be flying around at 32 years old, going through the quad injuries and all the injuries that he suffered throughout his career and still be able to get rebounds over 23-year-old seven-footers and he's jumping before these centers and grabbing it over their heads, it's, it's crazy to see. And it's, it's, it's cool to appreciate his greatness from afar when he was in OKC, he was in Houston. Like, well, Russell Westbrook is good, but, you know, he's, he's inefficient. And, you know, maybe he goes too hard. But then he comes to D.C. and you get to watch him every single night and see the work ethic, the drive that he has, it's, it's 
outer world. It's otherworldly. I can legit say I've never seen a basketball player like Russell Westbrook. Like, I really have never seen anything like it. It's crazy impressive. We're talking to Quentin Mayo, who uh, does podcasts on the Wizards. You can catch him on Twitch. Um, let's talk about somebody who I think deserves some shine in all of this, and that's Tommy Shepard. So mm-hmm. Tommy Shepard becomes a GM. He makes a trade. A lot of people didn't want to trade John Wall. John Wall did some great things here in D.C., so a lot yeah. of people didn't want to trade him. And then he makes this trade where he brings in Gafford and he got rid of your boy TBJ. Yeah. Yeah. He, he deserves a lot of credit. And, and it, it's funny because a lot of the moves, when you see it up front, you're like, oh, I don't know about that. These are just, these are just random guys. Like, he, he takes a lot of chances. He takes a lot of shots. I will give a shout-out to, I believe it was Chase Hughes from over at NBC, one of my buddies that just said, you know, the, the volume in which he's made transactions are just taking a lot of flyers on guys has helped him. Mo Wagner, Isak Bonga, like there's a lot of guys that have come in and played some really good minutes. Even though it's felt, it feels at times like a revolving door, he takes a lot of chances, and that just is a testament to the, his scouting process as well. They like Daniel Gafford before he came uh, out of the draft, and to be able to get him back, it looks like they won the trade for Daniel Gafford as well because, you know, Troy Brown Jr. is doing well, but he's, it's not as good as Daniel Gafford. doesn't have the impact that DG has on this team right now. Mo Wagner was waived by Boston. I mean, he's in Orlando now for the rest of the season. Shout out to him. But he's bringing in some guys that have really been able to, to add to this team. So he deserves all the credit in the world. And the Russell Westbrook trade, I love John Wall. You guys know me. A lot of people have loved John Wall. But obviously there was some type of disconnect between Ted Leonsis and John Wall. They, apparently they hadn't talked to each other up until that trade, maybe once in the offseason. So for him to, to make that trade, pull the trigger, and bring in a guy like Russell Westbrook, it looks like they won that trade. And they're on the, the verge of, not just making the play in tournament, but possibly being an eight seed or a seven seed. It could get really crazy. And things have been crazier, but uh, you got to give him major kudos. And I think if any changes happen at the front office or the coaching level this off season, I think Tommy Shepard is safe for at least another two years. Hey, Quinn, wow. let me ask you this because we, we've spent like seven minutes talking to you. We haven't talked about Bradley Beal. Yep. Amazing year. He'll be all NBA this year. Deserves all the accolades. Maybe he's going to be the top scorer. I see on your Twitter, you have a lot of back and forth with his wife, right? And yep. I just remember, you know, I did a segment one time on uh, Wizards Post Game called uh, Silly Stroke or Jumpers Broke. And it was during a rough stretch for Bradley Beal. And his family mm-hmm. was all in on me, and all in on doing the segment because I said his jumper was broke. Um, what's it like? Do you, they're like big fans of you. Yeah, they're, they're a great great group a great family i love all of them but it's it's really surreal to be a to be this close to them because you get to see how humble they are not just brad but their entire family they're really good people but it also is cool to just get a a peek behind the curtain of one of the best players in the nba every single day like I just don't understand how Brad can drop 50 and then come home and play Warzone with us all night for four hours and then go back out the next night and drop 48 points. Like, it's just it's crazy to see how good of a player he is and just how uh, down to earth he is. But their family is awesome. Uh, I just I appreciate the love they show me because they say I keep it real. A lot of people don't like to keep it real about this team for one reason or another. But if you suck, I'm going to say you suck. If I suck at my job and people say I suck, then I have to take that and, and maybe reevaluate what I'm doing. So I just like to be honest, and uh, that's what, I guess, players and uh, family members of players appreciate the most. So he's a Call of Duty guy, is that right? Yeah, he's good. I mean, he's not better than me. Not better than me, but he's decent. He's decent. <laughs> hmm. You know, uh, they, they had Steph talk about, uh, you know, is he paying attention to what Brad's doing, right? Brad had 50, yeah. and Steph said, yeah, damn right, you know. Um, yeah. And I know Brad has been asked about it, and he says he doesn't care. I would care. I want him to care. Can he? Oh, he cares. He, right. You want to talk about it a little bit? Yeah, he, he definitely cares. He definitely cares. I mean, what, as, as a competitor in any sport, you, you want to be the best or considered the best, and you want to be the leader of something. Now, right. is it at the top of his mind? No, I don't think it is. But when you're, when you're on the verge of – you're in a scoring battle with Steph Curry, arguably the best shooter – I don't even think it's an argument – the best shooter in NBA history – uh, of course you care. You want to lead the league and score. So we give him a hard time about that when him and Steph go back and forth. But he really, though, like, no no BS. Off off camera or off the court, he really just wants to win. He really just wants to win. So even though he does keep an eye on it, when Steph makes those comments like, 
yeah, of course I knew he had 50 before the game. Like that, that that's just a little. We had a we had a laugh about that the other day because Steph is a he's a funny guy, but they're both incredible and they both push each other. They both know each other off the floor. They both push each other to be better players, and that's all you want is to breed uh, competition. All right. So last question. I'm starting to think. All right. Maybe they they're going to be in the play-in tournament. Maybe they'll be the eight seed. Maybe they'll be the nine seed. Whatever. But if they get the Sixers, let's say. I think it's going to be a sweat. I mean, with the way the Westbrook's playing and the way Brad's been playing all season long, why couldn't they scare the Sixers and maybe, maybe, maybe I don't want to go so far, but, but maybe steal the first round? Uh, nah. I, I, <laughs> hey, love the team. I think they're, I think they're talented. I think they're, I think they're coming through at the right time, but, my biggest thing is that they don't play enough defense around the perimeter for me. They still struggle with pick and roll defense. Their three point defense is absolutely putrid. And you can see, like, even though they're on a stretch of they're winning more games than they're losing as of late, I think, what, 15 and 2 in the last 17 or something along those lines. They're playing against very weak competition. They played, they played OKC like 300 times. They played the Pacers 400 times. They played the Cavs 200 times. Like, okay, they're, they're clearly better. They have more talent than those guys, but. You have to be able to play defense against these teams that are more talented. The Philadelphia 76 are well coached. You can't leave guys wide open like the Wizards do. And if you do, you're gonna you're gonna get you're gonna get embarrassed. So while they do have the talent, that's when I put the onus on Scott Brooks to be able to coach these guys. We still we're still asking about pick and roll defense being coached at this point in the season. That's what scares me. If you can't defend the three, you're not gonna win games. You're just not going to do it, especially not in the playoffs. Quinn Mayo raining on the parade. <laughs> <laughs> I've been known to do that. I've been known to do that. <laughs> Just want to be a realist. All right, Quinn. Appreciate the time as always, man. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me.